uh, uh, Innovations and Algorithmic Game Theory Conference. I, about the innovations, we'll see, I suppose. Um, so before we start with our really packed program, a, a few administrative details as usual. So first thing is we're uh, taping all the talks. We'll be putting them openly on the internet. If you're a speaker and you don't want your talk to be available on the internet, please tell us and we will not put it there. Also, uh, it works better, the quality is better if you use our computer for your talk, so please uh, try to upload your slides onto our computer before the session that you're speaking. Uh, other uh, administrative details, just outside you have both your name tags, and the name tag has at the, at the opposite side the lunch tickets. And also there are little, there's a program that you can, uh, uh, there's a program booklet, and there's a, in one of the uh, folders outside, there's a small sheet of paper where you are asked to specify if you want to join us tomorrow uh, on Wednesday for the tour to the old city and the banquet. So please fill it up and give it to any one of the people uh, uh, wearing this kind of t-shirt, which are generally speaking student volunteers, which can also help answer any questions. So uh, I think at this point we're finished with uh, administrative questions for now. Oh, another thing, on the room next to us, there is uh, another conference going on, so let us try not to disturb them too much. At a certain point, a certain level, we cannot not disturb them, I suppose. And our coffee and, cake and cookies and stuff is downstairs. Uh, you've probably already seen that. And uh, at this point, uh, let me start with our first speaker. So Michael Rabin, uh, of course, we have all learned in our, our undergraduate studies his early work on automata theory uh, that created the field, basically. But at about the same time, very few people know, he also wrote probably the first paper on algorithmic game theory, where he actually exhibited a game where although one player has a winning strategy, the winning strategy is undecidable. And so if you take computation into account, the other player wins. So uh, today is not going to talk about that work, but rather about new work uh, connecting cryptography to stable marriages. Yes. Over there. Uh, now, can you can you leave some of the light on? Yeah, I think it's, it's visible. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I think we should all be grateful to the organizers for having put together this amazing, uh, this absolutely amazing symposium. So uh, let me see if we want to be on. Yes. So today I'll be talking about, as the title says, practical zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, discuss today applied to proving correctness of stable matching problems. But uh, this is actually a method, or if you want a technology, which we hope is going to have wide-ranging applications, as I'll at least hint at later on. To, uh, to areas, for example, such as mechanism design, the, uh, the conduct of uh, correct auctions, and many other possible explanations. Uh, the work I'm describing here started four years ago uh, at Harvard together with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Chris Torp, and later on with uh, Rocco Servidio at Columbia. And uh, then uh, there were further advances, as is indicated in the program, while I was visiting uh, Google Research, and uh, that is joint work with uh, Yishai Mansour, who is sitting here, Mutu Mutu Krishnan, and Moti Jung. Uh, and that was also an important uh, 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 improvement on what we had in the first paper. And what I'll be showing you today, the main point, the application to, uh, to matching problems is yet a further advance uh, made over the uh, past uh, three weeks or so. So, so, 
No. Yes. So I'll be talking about the motivation applications. Then I'll talk about the new zero-knowledge proofs, which I'll describe here. And uh, then I'll briefly, if time permits, and uh, I'm not being uh, uh, stopped, I'll, I'll mention a few next steps. So first of all, let me uh, talk about stable matchings. And uh, this is in the context of assigning uh, uh, assigning uh, uh, interns to hospitals. Uh, so, and this is actually based on an actual situation in the United States. There are a number of hospitals. Ah, yes. There are a number of hospitals. I'll, I'll, by the time the lecture is over, I'll. I'll uh, I'll do it correctly. So there are a number of hospitals in the United States. Uh, there are about 1,800 hospitals. And uh, around June, around this time of year, each of these hospitals has information about the uh, people about to finish uh, medical school. And every hospital ranks these candidates to become uh, residents in the hospital. And of course, they don't, there are about 18,000 uh, graduating students. They don't rank all of them. Maybe they rank, if they want to, to have uh, 100 or so residents or 50 residents, maybe they rank two or 300. But you can imagine for the purpose of this talk that they rank all of them. In practice, uh, they rank them one to 100, and the other ones are minus infinity. In the same way, each, every resident ranks the hospitals. So this guy is ranking them in this order, and so on. And then there is a certain, uh, there is a certain organization that creates a stable matching. And the property of the stable matching is that you don't have a pair of hospital and resident so that uh, this resident prefers this hospital over the place he was assigned to, and the hospital prefers him over that guy. And then, of course, there is instability, because since the hospital is here the boss, since the hospital is the boss, uh, they, they simply, simply kick, kick out the resident they have and they take the one who prefers them and whom they prefer over the one they have. Now that is a very classical problem, the stable marriage problem for which there is an algorithm. So that organization creates the stable matching. There are some complications which I'm not going into uh, because they are now they take into consideration also couples uh, husband, wife, spouses who want to be at the same place, and that makes uh, the assignment more complicated. But let's talk about the pure uh, case. Now, uh, now uh, the point is that uh, uh, they want to, on the one hand, and in fact they do maintain complete secrecy of the preference lists. Because, for example, you don't want to have a situation where at mass general, uh, one resident is going to say, I was number seven on the list, and you uh, were just number 45. And similarly, and that holds here as well, there are jealousies between hospitals and, and departments, uh, say, neurogeology, neurogeology neurology departments in different hospitals. And if you come to a place where they know that you actually prefer several of your uh, uh, rivals way above, then this is an unhealthy situation. So you have to trust the administrator, the person or the organization running the algorithm that uh, the assignment was done 
properly the announced assignment without knowing the preferences and you don't want to suspect that maybe the administrator had a cousin whom he has sent over you to, let's say, to Mass General, whereas actually you uh, had uh, the, the priority to go there. So, uh, so, ooh, uh, so the, the data consists of, for each resident, for each, uh, for each resident have a ranking of the hospitals, numbers between 1 and L, and for each hospital, if there are uh, L hospitals, and for each hospital there is a ranking of the uh, prospective candidates of the residents, numbers between 1 and N. The administrator gets the data, computes stable matching, and informs the hospitals and the, uh, and the residents. Now, as I have already said, we, we do want to maintain secrecy with respect to the rankings. And this is uh, a very important point. Now, what you have to do is, and that's the challenge, you have to prove statements such as this preference of, uh, of hospitals by the IF uh, resident and this preference of residents by the JF hospital and you want to be able to prove to all participants, to the whole world, that there is no violation of stable matching without revealing any of the values, the x's and the y's. Looks, for those who have never encountered such challenges, looks completely impossible. Now, this is done by the method of zero-knowledge proofs, which was innovated by uh, Goldwasser, Mikali, and Rykov in, uh, in uh, 1985, brilliant people. And they showed that you can prove statements about solutions without revealing any, any data of the details except the correctness of the solution. For example, that the graph is free colorable. They treated another problem, but uh, that's a typical example. Now, there are a number of technologies or methods for doing it. I list them here. I'm not going to enumerate them. The problem is that none of these methods is really useful in practice because they would take too much time, for example, in order to, say, prove the correctness of stable matching. And what I'm going to describe here is an innovation which really moves the ability to prove such correctness results in a very practical, really practical way. And I'll show you some uh, experimental results about how, how this uh, is amazingly practical and, and fast. Good. So now, uh, our approach. As I said, that was innovated four years at Harvard. Instead of trying to translate the correctness proof into, let's say, the uh, free uh, graph free colorability, uh, which would be uh, just uh, impossible, uh, we work directly with numbers. And actually, the numbers that come into problems like that, and also in the pro into problems like uh, describing auctions, the numbers are, in practice, not very large. So, uh, so for example, we uh, take a prime number which uh, has about 64 digits. And uh, if you consider situations of auctions where we want to prove correctness of result without revealing values, uh, 2 to the 64, if we, uh, if we take the, the basic uh, unit in the auction as, say, $1,000, uh, 
is completely sufficient to describe the situation at hand. And uh, the number, and of course, uh, in the case of hospitals and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and residents, we are talking about numbers smaller than, let's say, twenty thousand. Now, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, I claim that uh, a wide range of computations and zero knowledge proofs. Uh, can be encompassed in the formulation of a generalized straight line computation and then the verification of the correctness of the results of such a computation. So I'm going very, very quickly. The, uh, the purpose of this lecture, as the purpose of every lecture should be, is really to convey ideas and not all the uh, grabby, uh, small technical details. So I hope if you come out of the lecture having a feel of how we made all of that possible without being able to take an exam next Monday, uh, you know, about uh, the details of this or that proof, then uh, I feel that we were successful. So, uh, so uh, we have now, unlike uh, classical zero-knowledge proofs, here we have situations where there are inputs. The classical zero-knowledge proof is you have a graph on the table, so to speak, which everybody is, knows, and you want to prove zero-knowledge proof that there is a free uh, colorability for that graph. Here there are inputs. Think about auctions, so x1 up to xn may be bids for the uh, item which is being auctioned. Think about the example I gave, then x1 up to xn include all these ranking values. So there are these input values. And somebody uh, whom we call an evaluator prover conducts a generalized, what we call straight line computation and produces outputs, xl, xl plus one and so on, which are the answers to the question being asked. And what are the properties of uh, why, uh, of, uh, or how is such a straight line computation defined? For every m beyond the input, there exist two values, i and j, smaller, so that xm is xi plus xj. Remember, we are in the field of p elements, so we take it mod p or it is the product, or it is the statement, which is going to be important in auctions and so on, that xi is less or equal as a number than xj. So that's our notion of a straight line computation. Now, the evaluator prover posts the outputs, and then he posts a zero-knowledge proof of the correctness of the result. And the uh, proof of correctness is checkable by a verifier interacting with the evaluator prover. So again, for those who had a depraved childhood and never saw how that process works, I'm going to uh, very briefly describe it. The interactive proof is that the evaluator prover creates the proof, presents it to the verifier. Uh, the verifier sends to the evaluator prover a certain number of random challenges. The verifier uh, responds with responses and so on. Verifier co uh, checks the correctness of the responses. This, for example, is being repeated 30 times, and if it checks out correctly in each of these rounds, then the verifier knows that the claim by the evaluator prover is correct and the probability of having been cheated is, let's say, for 30 rounds, 1 over 2 to the 30, which is about 1 over a billion. That's the probability of being cheated. So there is a great deal of assurance. Wonderful. Now, how is that done? 
our magical solution, our new idea is the following. That the values, the input values and all the values in the, uh, in the uh, straight line computation are being randomly represented by vectors, by pairs. So the random representation of x is a pair uv. By definition, the value of such a vector is u plus v uh, mod p, that's x. Now, the way you create a random representation like that, uh, either one of the bidders, say in an auction, or later on the evaluator prover, he or she randomly choose that's a notation due to Michali Goldwasser, Goldwasser Michali. Randomly chooses u between 1 and p minus 1, takes v as x minus u, and then, uh, of course, u plus v mod p is x. Now, the point of that random representation is that having a look at u by itself or at v by itself gives information theoretically zero information about the value of x. And that's how we are going, our proofs are going to be information theoretically hiding of all relevant values, except for the output. Good. Now, uh, we are going to use a commitment function. So I'll describe the commitment uh, to, uh, to the vector x is a commitment to the first coordinate and to the second coordinate. And the evaluator prove, uh, prover needs to be able to zero knowledge proof statements such for, for vectors which are being posted by these commitments as if within closed envelopes. He has to prove about, you know, these closed envelopes that the value of the x hidden here plus the value of the y hidden here is equal to the value hidden uh, in, uh, you know, in the third, uh, uh, by the third uh, pair of commitments. And similarly for multiplication and for uh, inequalities. Now, uh, I, I don't want to go, we were using uh, to be uh, sort of uh, kosher from the point of view of the people uh, who, who are nitpicking in, in uh, uh, cryptology. We were using uh, Pedersen commitment in order to get the situation that we are really um, uh, information theoretically hiding. But in practice, what we are doing uh, is that we use for the commitment an encryption like AES. And the way a value is being, uh, a single value coordinate is being committed to, there is a choice of a random key and then E, the uh, encryption of U by means of uh, using the key K is the commitment. And to decommit, whoever made the commitment reveals the key to whoever uh, uh, wants to see the value. Good. Now, uh, now let me see how much time do I have. 12 more minutes. So I'll have to uh, be a real sportsman and, and hop around. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll go uh, uh, to a picture. So uh, the commitments are these closed envelopes. Instead of taking a very large uh, P, we, um, we assume P is 17. So suppose you have the value 3 plus 15, which is uh, mod 17 is 1. Uh, uh, and you have uh, the value, uh, the value, uh, sorry, you have the value x is 3 plus 4 vertically is 7. And then you have the other value is uh, 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 24 is also 7. 
and you want to prove that what is hidden in this pair and in that pair is equal to what is hidden in this pair. So the way this is being done is that the evaluator prover, you see it's almost like this vector plus that vector should be equal to this vector, but the difference is a zero value vector. And the evaluator prover reveals the zero value vector, which is 10 minus 10. And then the proof goes by, uh, boom. The proof goes, now I got lost. Uh, the proof goes by uh, the, uh, the verifier randomly chooses C between 1 and 2. 1 means open all the top envelopes. And let's say if the key chose 1, then the verifier checks that 3 plus 15 is equal to 8 mod 17 plus 10. Had he chosen 2, then the other three envelopes were opened. And then you would check that 4 plus 9 is equal to 6 minus 10. And you see that if what is hidden in those pairs of envelopes does not satisfy the plus condition, if it does not satisfy the plus condition, then the probability of the evaluator prover getting away with a lie is less or equal to one half. And now uh, I have to skip, I have to take giant steps. I skip the description of how you verify multiplications and I skip the description, maybe I'll say a word about how you verify inequalities, and I want to get to the eventual challenge. So there is a method of uh, verifying multiplications which is, uh, which is similar, and uh, what you do is for the, uh, for the uh, is, uh, for the uh, generalized straight line computation, you verify not individually all additions, you verify all additions together by opening upon challenge either the first or the second coordinates. And then you can see that again, so it's as if, you know, everybody uh, here presents a certain statement and I'm presenting a, ra a random challenge. And if any one of you is lying, anyone, then uh, my probability of finding that out, that anyone is lying, my probability of not finding out is less or equal to one half. And similar for multiplications. And this allows a one shot verification with probability of being cheated less or equal to one half of the total of the total uh, straight line computation. Very good. But now, uh, and you can see the details in you know in the posted uh, in the posted uh, slides. Now, being cheated with probability one half uh, is thank you. I'll, I'll get there. Uh, and beyond, no. Uh, so, uh, so uh, the probability of being cheated with uh, one half is unacceptable. So what you have to do is to actually have many copies and you have to do it, uh, say, 50 times. And this is something which we did very efficiently uh, as I said, together with uh, Yishai, uh, Mutu Mutu Krishnan, and Moti Jung at, um, at uh, Google. Namely, uh, the, uh, say the bidders, the people who submit, the people who submit the bid values, everyone submits, say, 50 copies of their bid, all in that hidden form in randomly in envelopes uh, in the form of randomly created representations. 
then you have the problem of showing consistency. Maybe the cheating is in the form of not all of these representing the same value. So we had a very efficient way of proving that value consistency. And beyond that, we had a way of, once the values were, uh, uh, by all the bidders say, where 50 copies were submitted, the evaluator prover, who in this case is the auctioneer, can create additional 300 copies of each bid. And then using up the original 50, he proves that of the new ones, he gives a zero knowledge proof without revealing any values, that amongst the new ones, the overwhelming majority are value consistent. Let's say nine tenths of them represent the same value. And then those are being used to create 30 proofs of, um, of correctness of the straight line computation. And as I said, in this straight line computation, you can encode correctness of almost any financial process. So now I want to come to the, uh, you see how much I saved you, uh, how much agony. This business of proving the inequalities is absolutely beautiful. We are using the Lagrange theorem that every integer is expressible as a sum of four squares, and we are using an efficient algorithm for actually doing it, which was discovered in 1977, uh, 200 years after Lagrange's original, uh, original uh, theorem. So, good. So, now, uh, now I come to the new challenge. The proofs of the inequalities are being done or were done by actually stating, say you had a pair like this, you had uh, two values given by representations, this value and this value, each given in two envelopes, you proved the inequality, in other words, the evaluator prover claimed this inequality and proved it, which, for example, for the verification of auctions is good enough. But here, for the case of stable matchings, we cannot say what the inequality relations are. These are exactly the preferences that we want to keep secret. So the new step was that without revealing the truth value, without revealing that, the EP can give a zero knowledge proof for posted three commitments, commitment to the value X. These are the two envelopes for the two coordinates, same here and same here. That, and without revealing any one of these values, he can prove that the value hidden by the pair by the random representation of z, the value is 1 if this is smaller than that and is 0 else. And that enables you to prove the non-existence of such, the negation of all such possible contradictions, possible switches. You can prove these statements without actually revealing the values of the inequalities. I'll get there. So this uh, was a new challenge uh, beyond what we did, uh, we did before. Now I want to uh, sort of uh, uh, propagandize uh, in general, you know, what we did. We have a new method of treating various financial processes such as complicated auctions and proof statements while the auction is going on or at the end of the auction. Proof statements while keeping value secret and in many forms of auctions, in fact, the participants insist on keeping bids and quantities they wanted, etc., keeping them secret. So you can prove at the end the correctness. This is essentially done. The question I want to raise is, how can you do 
more powerful, useful, new mechanism designs where you use the possibility of, um, uh, of revealing exactly what you want to reveal and keeping secret exactly what you want to keep secret. How do you use that technology to innovate in, for example, mechanism design? One more slide I would like to show you. Uh, if you, uh, no, I, I don't find it. But I want to give you an idea of how efficient what we are doing is. So if you want, and uh, this is an experimental result, if you want to prove the correctness without revealing any values of a 100 participant victory auction, 100 participant victory auction, where the uh, bids are, you know, any values, doesn't really matter, then it's almost unbelievable. You can prove the correctness of that in one millisecond. So for example, at Google, where they were considering, it remains to be seen where, where, whether it will be used, where they have an enormous volume of auctions. This incredible practical speed is of great significance. And similarly, if you consider various auction uh, processes, for example, or other mechanisms, which sort of evolve in real time, and you want to prove in the middle, you want to prove certain statements about certain relations without revealing values, then this enormous speed is, is really uh, of great practical significance. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one short question? Yes. Eva? Yeah. So you showed the representation of people's preferences by you know, saying there's a more radical new take with an unknown outcome. But I could have said represent my preferences by the bids, but I prefer you to not. So the end result is no longer representation. But if I do that, then would you use the different traditional bidding arrangements? I didn't say that's the right thing. You use that as a Well, the, the way the way this uh, uh, somebody is trying to blind me I don't know what ah I see my my mistake I'm walking in front of the screen I wanted to be closer to you so there are, there are two points here it doesn't matter how these preferences whether the preferences were expressed by numerical values or by inequalities if you consider the classical uh, the classical zero knowledge proofs you would have had, if you represent it the way you do, you would have had to create a circuit for calculating these inequalities or verifying the inequalities and then have, you know, these uh, preferences put in secretly by the participants into the circuit. Now, there are two problems about this. First of all, we claim, and this was really uh, in practice uh, verified, what we are doing is really understandable by people who, uh, who didn't really have a course on zero knowledge proofs and don't see, uh, you know, don't really understand how you prove the correctness of a computation by, by a circuit, point one. Point two is that this translation into the circuit, the translation into the circuit, maybe there is a mistake in that translation by itself. I mean, this is so complicated. You look at that circuit, it has millions of gates. So who vouches that, that this is actually correct? Third, the issue of speed comes in. And the, both the transparency, the intellectual transparency of what we do, and the uh, practical speed is what makes this really overwhelmingly superior. Thank you again. Could I make one more point? I can't resist. Uh, nobody asked me that question. How about the evaluator approver, the administrator? How about this guy? 
leaking out information. Maybe he has a cousin and he tells him whatever he leaks out. Or similarly, Fed Reserve uh, conducts an auction and there is a bad apple there who leaks out for half a million dollars bid values. So this we treated by suggesting the use of a secure processor. Now these processors which are essentially enclosed, there is an IBM technology like that. The information comes in, the results come out and the proof comes out and nothing else. It's sort of physically secure. Now if you think about it, if you are using the secure processor, you definitely want to have a proof of correctness because maybe it was not programmed correctly or maybe a switch flipped instead of flopped. But the proof of correctness can be verified by one and for all and there is complete assurance without having any knowledge about what happened inside there. Okay.